Hi everyone, welcome to the next weathering video. This video is going to be the second part of weathering. It's gonna be focusing on chemical weathering. The first video was for physical weathering. So if you did not watch that, that is a pre-video for this one. You should watch that one first. All right, here we go. Chemical weathering. So we talked about physical properties, meaning you would just break something and then the, the material would stay the same. Chemical is totally different. Uh, this is going to be some type of chemical reaction is going to occur and the substance then will be completely different than the one that it was originally. So for example, um, one of the main forms of chemical weathering that we're going to be talking about is rusting. You probably heard of it. Um, so that's a chemical reaction. Rust is no longer the actual original material. If your bike starts to rust, and if you find a piece of rust on your bike, that is no longer the aluminum frame of your bike. The aluminum, or whatever metal it is, turned into rust through a chemical reaction. So anything that causes a chemical reaction is going to be chemical weathering. All right. So the big thing here is it creates a new substance. The new substance is nothing like the original substance. It has its own new properties. So it's a completely different thing. A couple of examples are burning, digestion, uh, cooking something, or like we said, rust. So we're gonna go through each type. There's really not that many. The first one is called oxidation. It's the fancy science word for rusting. It's when oxygen in the air combines with some minerals in the material and you get rust like these pictures below. It's rusty. So there's your formula. It's iron plus oxygen equals rust. There's a rusty rock. It's nice and rusty. Uh, Statue of Liberty uh, went through the process of oxidation. It used to be copper. Copper react with the oxygen and you get the green color that you see at the Statue of Liberty now. The second type of chemical weathering is called carbonation. This is when you have water reacting with carbon dioxide, which is in the air, and it becomes an acid called carbonic acid. And if you remember from class, we talked about calcite a lot. Calcite bubbles with acid, it dissolves. So this carbonation process is gonna be really important because it's gonna create carbonic acid, which can come down in rain and it could land on rocks that have calcite in it, which will dissolve them away. It will make caves. So if you have carbonic acid that leaks through the ground, it can hit into limestone rock and then start dissolving all this material in there away, and this is how caves form. Of course, it takes a very long time, but this is really where, where the process happens, how it happens. Here's a little picture. The carbonic acid seeps into the ground, since it has um, an acid property, it will dissolve calcite. Calcite's in a lot of limestone. So you get these holes in the ground, underground like this, and it creates these cave formations. So the big thing here is calcite dissolves limestone, which creates caves. And this is chemical weathering. And the key word that you know it's chemical is because something dissolved. That's a chemical reaction. This is a reaction. Okay. All right, here's three little questions. We're gonna see if you can get them. Use educated guesses because the first one uh, talks about the water table. So you gotta use the picture below. It says in the empty box, which is right here, on the left side of the cross section, cross sections means side view. Uh, draw a horizontal line to indicate the level of the water table. So what I want you to do, since clearly you can't draw on your phone, take your fingertip and somewhere in this box, right over here, outline with your finger where you think the water table would go. Just take a guess. All right, well, if you look at the key down here, the water is the black area, the water table is right here. That's the water table. It's the highest point of the water under the ground. Fifty-two. The precipitation in this area is becoming more acidic. Explain why acid rain weathers limestone. For that, the answer would be limestone has our favorite mineral, calcite 
which dissolves with acid. Number 53, identify one source of pollution caused by humans that would contribute to precipitation becoming more acid. So uh, acidic, think about it. What do, do humans do that cause pollution? So that would be an answer. So come up with something. First thing that comes to mind for me is industry. Like um, cities, uh, you could say car exhaust. There's a lot. So anything that causes pollution. Um, landfills, which is like a big garbage dump. So stuff like that. So here's a picture of a guy in a cave. These are stalagmites and stalactites. They form from dripping down and it makes it longer and longer and longer and longer. Pollution. So this is another form of chemical weathering. You have sulfur and nitrogen that go into the atmosphere and it's from burning fossil fuels and that's gonna make things acidic. So pollution makes things acidic, which means you're gonna have chemical weathering. So you're gonna have a lot of chemical weathering near places that have a lot of pollution like this. So near the city and stuff like that, there's a lot of chemical weathering because there's a lot of acid rain. And don't think of acid rain like it's gonna dissolve your skin, it's just on a pH scale like here, acidic means it has a lower pH. So like if you think about it, um, normal is neutral is seven, a Coca-Cola is 3.5. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean very acidic for acid rain, but it's anywhere under five. The more acidic is the lower the number. So for most weathering, we need water. Water is really important. It does a lot of breaking down of stuff. So here's three questions. We'll see what you can do. Carbonation and oxidation are examples of what type of weathering? The answer here is chemical. That was supposed to be an explanation point. Number two, most chemical weathering needs the presence of, we just talked about it, water. Yeah, good job. The type of weathering that does not change the chemical makeup of the rock is physical. Another word for physical you might see is called mechanical weathering. It's the same thing. All right, so now we're going to talk about how can we make weathering happen faster. There's, I think, four things you can do to make things break down faster. And the first thing is a weathered tombstone, apparently. <laughs> You could just see in this picture, the words are illegible. So that probably happened from the weather. They don't look as good as they used to. This is a statue. The statue's face is gone. This happened over the course of like 60 years. So went from that to that. Again, from weather. So the first thing to make things dissolve faster is temperature. If you put sugar in tea, your sugar is going to dissolve faster if you stir it in a hot tea rather than cold tea. So things dissolve better when it's hot. The second thing that makes it dissolve faster is breaking it into little pieces. That's called increasing surface area. If you didn't know that, you should write it. Increases surface area equals break into smaller pieces. So my example of this is crushed ice versus cubed ice. Cubed ice will be in your drink a lot longer than crushed ice. Crushed ice dissolves a lot faster because it's smaller little pieces. So breaking rocks into smaller pieces causes them to weather faster. Third thing is mineral composition. And if you remember from minerals, we sort of talked about this. Things that are really have a high hardness are going to take longer to break down, like quartz. Quartz is a really hard mineral, so it doesn't break down easily. But if you have a rock made of talc, talc is really, really soft. That's going to take a really short time to break down because it's soft. Got our scratch tests. And the last one is moving stuff. If you have rocks that are moving around a lot, they're going to break down faster because they're all hitting into each other. Do you remember what it's called when rocks hit other rocks? That is a form of physical weathering. That's called abrasion. We talked about that in the physical weathering video. 
So the rocks become smoother and rounder if they're moved by water. All right, we did a question like this in the last video. Let's see how you do. Which rock is the most resistant to weathering? Most resistant means it does not break down easily. So if you remember, we can draw our line like this. And if you put the border between each zone, it looks like this top piece didn't weather away at all. This lost this amount, this lost this amount, this lost this, this lost this, that's a lot, this lost this, and this lost all that. So it seems Dolostone is the most resistant. Which one's the least resistant? How do the opposite? If you look at our previous picture, the one that lost the most, the three that lost the most, obviously I would say is Shale. Shale weathered away the most. So we have an arch here, and essentially to make arches, it's pretty cool. All this rock here that was once here, it was part of this mountain on the left and the right, this was uh, softer. It wasn't as hard. So when the wind comes through, it weathers all this stuff away first, and this m material up here was harder, so it survived. So this has to do with mineral hardness. The harder ones are going to take longer to weather. Can you guess what happened if you t had rocks that looked like this and then they turned into this? Good job. They were moved by water, probably. Remember, water rounds and smooths rocks. Why do they get round and smooth? Good job. It's because it chips off the corners to make it rounded. All right, so this is a little chart here, and it shows rainfall, which is the moisture, and it shows temperature. So if you look at the temperature, it goes backwards. So this is the coldest on the top. This is hot on the bottom. And then for rainfall, it's backwards. This is very moist area, and over here is dry. OK? So the question is, you can figure out where certain types of weathering occur based on some data. So if the climate is warm and dry, if it's dry, you're not going to have a lot of water, so you're not going to have a lot of like frost action or anything like that, but you'll have lots of abrasion because it's like a desert, hot and dry. So you have the wind and the sand. So here's another one. Cold and moisture would be a lot of physical weathering. If there's a lot of moisture and it's cold, you'll get a lot of ice forming, so you might have a lot of frost action here. And last but not least, this is actually the most important one that comes up a lot. You're going to get the most chemical weathering. Remember, for chemical weathering, you need a lot of water. So it's going to be somewhere that's moisture, has a lot of moisture, and also warm. Because remember, temperature increases, weathering increases. So warm and moisture are going to have your most weathering in general, and a lot of it's going to be chemical. So your best example here is a rainforest is going to have, be an area that's warm with a lot of moisture. You're going to have a lot of dissolving going on there. So if you look on this chart, I'm going to give you a couple of choices. Where is the warm area and moist area going to be? Is it going to be at location A? Is it going to be at location B? Is it going to be at location C? Or is it going to be at location D? All right, so to get to warm and moist, you want to go to annual temperature is hot, so it's somewhere down here, above 20. And then very, very high rainfall, so somewhere over here. So it looks like this corner, and look. Warm and moist give you strong chemical weathering, like we just talked about. The end product of weathering is sediments. So if you break stuff down, you're going to get small pieces of rock. And this is going to lead us into what we're going to be talking about next, which is um, soil. So if you have a lot of broken down material, and you have a lot of biologic activity, which is like life, essentially, you're going to create a lot of soil. So that's going to be where we're going to lead in to next. But to end this video, we're going to do one question. 34, I will read it to you. Lichens are usually the first organisms that appear in barren, rocky, rocky areas. They use root-like structures to split bedrock into small fragments. Lichens also secrete acidic solutions that help break down rock. 
The cross section below represents an area where lichens first appeared in time one, and then that same area hundreds of years later after it was changed by the lichens and exposed to air and water. So that's over here. So time one, time two. Lichens are these organisms. So they want to know, how was the soil in time two most likely formed? Well, there's a couple of things. Lichens are organisms, so they're alive. So that was a big hit. Uh, hint. They, something alive helped the soil become soil. And the second thing is, there was rock broken down. So this is weathering. And the lichens over here were your biological activity. So something that was alive and breaking down rock made the soil. So your answer was two. All right. Well, I hope you found this interesting. Remember, you can watch these as many times as you need to. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. All right. I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.